right now. There's a lot less gas specifically oxygen gas. So the partial pressure of oxygen that helps you much less. So the amount of oxygen that isn't going into the liquid layers of the upper wide is going to be less. So people are going to have to take more inhalations to accommodate to get the oxygen in there. Uh, and that can lead to uh, like a specific source of breath. Uh, like it is people more likely to pass out having less oxygen entering their lungs. Uh, so altitude is definitely a player uh, that makes sense in terms of partial pressures. Oxygen, the reason why it moves out of uh, alveoli and can be out of the blood oxygen comes into the bottom part of the respiratory, it moves out of alveoli into your bloodstream is because if you look at the amount of oxygen in the capillaries that are going up into the alveolar bundles, the pressure, partial pressure of oxygen is greater in the alveolar sac than it is in the capillary, and that's why oxygen goes in the capillary. Conversely, it's opposite when you look at CO2. Uh, if this is an alveolar bundle, and here's the capillary, one right next to it, here's the capillary, one right next to it, CO2 pressure is going to be lower in the alveolus than it is in the capillary. So in the capillary, CO2 pressure is greater because CO2 is at least part you get from the cells doing the respiration. You want to go back to the lungs, so your capillaries are taking it back in here. And because of the fact that the partial pressure CO2 is more bigger in your capillary than it is in here, the CO2 is going to make its way from the capillaries into the alveolus, allowing you to exit in the opposite flow with oxygen because the partial pressure is looking at that gas. If you look at this particular uh, uh, graph here, it shows you in the different parts of the atmosphere and in the body how the partial pressures work. And this is the nitrogen. It's almost the same throughout. In the atmosphere, the partial pressure is actually a little greater than within the body. It doesn't change much the body. That's just such a major part of uh, the gas that we inhale and these part of the gas that we're combustion. That's not going to change that much. But when we look at oxygen, look at the percentage in terms of the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere and how it gradually gets lower. Um, the partial pressure of oxygen can only slide so far into the body. So it does get to our cells. But the relative amount of oxygen that's in the cells of our body, compared to the atmosphere, atmosphere, gets a significant less. Um, the alveolar gas, this is the gas actually in the alveoli. Here's the partial pressures in arterial blood, uh, taking that blood to the body out of the heart. Uh, and then venous blood, this is the blood going back to the heart. We have a here. This is uh, partial pressures within cells. And finally, some respiratory conditions and disorders. Asthma is chronic bronchoconstriction. So the bronchioles uh, in the lungs just have problems expanding them. That can lead to asthma. And, and the thing is, asthma attacks happen when somebody who has that uh, slightly more restricted bronchial set, they do physical exertion. They think they're playing a soccer game, playing a softball game, have you? And the need to get more areas in their body because their heart's getting faster and they get more of their muscles, that's when the asthma attack can happen. And it's not just because of physical exertion, but stress can bring an asthma attack. So the trick of asthma, there currently is no cure, um, is bronchodilators. So the inhalers that people use uh, when, when they have asthma or they get asthma attack, those inhalers, they typically cause a dilation of muscles to get more air uh, into the respiratory tree, and they get relief from that. Uh, one trick that I've heard works for some people is somebody who lives in a very urban area where the air quality is poor, maybe they live next to a factory, maybe they live next to where a lot of cars are, people are walking on the bike. If they move to a more rural area, to the countryside, the air quality is a little bit better, and that can actually have a positive effect on some people's asthma. Their symptoms are reduced all the time, so you can do that. Uh, Tensophema is a gradual deterioration of the alveolar bundles in the lungs. If those little sacs get damaged, and there are more spaces in the lungs, the ability to actually get air into your bloodstream with each breath is reduced. Tensophema happens because of smoking, because of the inhaling smoke. Um, usually it's, it's trauma that's going to cause that more smoke. But over time, um, as a person gets older, you're more likely to experience symptoms of that too. So in elderly people, tensophema tends to gradually happen, at least minor symptoms, even if they never smoked. So that inevitable damage that happens over the years to lung tissue um, is just more common than you get. Lung cancer is when you get the development of uh, tumors in the lungs. So tensophema can lead to lung cancer if it's even bad enough. And lung cancer uh, is, of course, more likely to happen if you're a smoker, but even people who never smoke in their life can get lung cancer. Um, and lung cancer, like many cancers, has really to spread to the rest of the body, especially because there's so much blood flow in the lungs and lymphatic tissue um, that you find all throughout the body. So the spreading of lung cancer to other organs uh, this is supposed to tend to kill the person. Laryngitis and bronchitis, uh, those are irritations or infections of the larynx and uh, the bronchioles. Laryngitis is an infection of the larynx. You can make your voice sound like this because your voice box, your vocal folds, of course, are in the larynx. So the infection of that should definitely have an effect on your voice or you can use your voice entirely. And then bronchitis is an infection a little bit further down the lower respiratory tract. Uh, and that's when you get something with coughing. Uh, the thing with sneezing and coughing is sneezing has an irritation in the upper respiratory tract. So getting dust or uh, particles into the nasal region and the throat region is going to be, you know, probably going to have that sneeze. And if you didn't know, sneeze is happening over 100 miles per hour. Uh, so it is. Uh, bronchitis or, you know, getting uh, deeper irritation, uh, production of mucus, chest of production of mucus, irritation in the lower respiratory tract is going to cause coughing. You know, there's your body's natural ability to try to get that stuff out. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder. Um, it's a genetic biology. It's um, autosomal recessive. And cystic fibrosis is a pro uh, problem uh, with a certain kind of protein channel in cells that's supposed to shuttle along an ion. Um, if you're not able to do that, the accumulation of those ions, those discharged atoms, tends to attract water because of osmosis. And cystic fibrosis leads to um, production of excess mucus or collection of excess mucus in organs like the pancreas and the lungs. So cystic fibrosis does affect um, the lungs. Um, so the main person that gets the negative consequence of cystic fibrosis, there is no cure, uh, but there are treatments for this disease. Decompression sickness, also called the bends, tends to happen because of dramatic altitude changes or, more commonly, if a scuba diver has to go really deep and they come up way too quickly to the surface because they were down low and they had a highly compressed um, oxygen tank, uh, getting oxygen in the lungs. If they don't go up gradually and adjust the pressure of their body, we acclimate. Going up way too fast to the surface is going to cause a dramatic accumulation of nitrogen gas in parts of the bloodstream. And it, uh, it can kill a person. It can be very painful in terms of accumulation of nitrogen gas in the joints. So if you do have somebody who gets aggressive for the vent, you want to take them to uh, a hospital nearby. We're going to 
have uh, a hybrid chamber and then that can uh, cure vents. Uh, some people have a superficial so the same result is that tuberculosis is a bacterial infection of the lungs, caused by bacterial tuberculosis. Uh, that you don't see as much in first world countries and industrialization anymore, but it does happen occasionally. And this bacteria gets into the lungs and goes through a hybrid infusion of bacteria that binds it and moves around the lungs. You can develop a single tuberculosis result sense. Uh, bacteria and that's they grow, they can actually have these uh, bacterial colonies continue to grow. This is just tuberculosis uh, bacteria that can break the lungs and cause the mass of uh, lung bleeding, and that's what I'm talking about with blood. It's associated tuberculosis and these things are death. Uh, so if you don't get treatment with antibiotics early on, uh, it can take you to death. Uh, there's a test they do where they uh, take a little section of your forearm and a little puffy bump, and you go back a little bit later, and the bump's gone away. That means that you don't have any device for tuberculosis you've ever exposed to it. It means you're not sick with it. So if that bump does not go away, it means you've been exposed to TB, you've been exposed to tuberculosis, that's the bacteria. Just because you've been exposed to it and it's gone into your body, it doesn't mean you have infection. So see if they actually have the tuberculosis colonies in there uh, amongst the bigger chest x-ray. And the chest x-ray works with like a little tuberculosis, uh, a little uh, fat, and they appear in x-ray, and it happens that you're sick with uh, tuberculosis. <laughs> so then you syndrome. Um, this kills thousands of babies per year in the United States alone. Um, all the answers with the kids are not known, but what they do think is that um, the way you place your baby in the crib can have an effect on whether or not kids can happen, uh, but it's not foolproof. Um, so since um, it typically happens when the baby has gone to sleep, um, they stop reading turn blue and, um, and pass away. They think that one of the parts of the brain that they think has to do with it is early on in the end of its life. The respiratory centers associated with the medulla oblongata and the lower parts of the brain are still establishing themselves with how they connect to other parts of the brain and other parts of the brain, and that might have something to do with it. Uh, so if you have a child, talk to the physician about how to um, maximize the chances of being not diagnosed. Pneumonia. Pneumonia is a uh, pneumonia, but typically bacterial infection that causes um, production of lots of mucus uh, at the base of the lungs where you have uh, those bronchioles and alveolar bubbles. And pneumonia uh, can be fatal. Uh, they can be cured, but it doesn't get down to some people. Um, if it's going to tend to somebody who is much older, who has been a chronic smoker, because like I said earlier, lesson, people who smoke a lot tend to damage the cilia that are meant to sleep up the extra sleep because you don't drown your own fluids in the center. Uh, so pneumonia uh, has to do with basically drowning uh, into fluids in the lungs. Uh, but it can be cured. Some people thoracic acid earlier is getting um, uh, a leakage of air into the space. Uh, you know, this is called the right atrium. The right ventricle will be in here. 
just keep that creeper looking from the uh, posterior side. Uh, if you're looking from behind, then you'll have to be the same left as the subject. The coronary artery is in general term for deep blood vessels that supply the heart muscle tissue itself with blood. It's interesting to think about. The heart itself needs blood as well. So here's the heart's role is to uh, circulate blood to the entire body. So all the cells are needed. But the heart itself does not get blood. It won't get the nourishment. It won't get the sugars and uh, gas that it needs to be able to keep providing the sugar and gas to the rest of the body. Uh, to get all of that blood inside of those uh, muscle uh, fibers. If you get a clog, if you get a blockage in the coronary arteries, you can get a heart attack. There are these veins coming out from uh, the top portion, the superior portion of the heart. The major one is the aorta. Uh, that is a major artery that's sending blood to the body. And then there are veins as well. And we'll get to those in more detail. This slide is pleasant. And lastly, fat. All of this yellow stuff. Yeah, that's lipid. That's, that's fat. And you're going to see it on the surface of the heart. You're also going to see it around the outside of the heart, especially around the pericardium, uh, as it cushioning. You want to cushion it to the thoracic uh, cavity. Uh, it's a very precious organ. You don't want it to get damaged. So having some of that fat is a nice little uh, buffer cushion. Now, the fat on the outside here, I don't think this person is unhealthy. It's normal to have some fat on the outside. The fat you don't want is inside the coronary arteries. So look at how blood flows through the heart. Uh, it should be a one-way trip. Uh, you can mean a uh, one-way stream. I just say it. You do not want backflow. And we'll talk more later about what the backflow is and how that happens. When we start with blood coming back from the body uh, into the heart, so the idea that's taking blood from above the heart from below the heart back into it, and you want the blood going back in the heart, so we can the lungs, where you can exhale CO2 that's stimulating the blood, get O2 back in the blood, and send it back out to the body. So the cava is here. And here, you can see it on the right side of the heart, from the right, it's actually to your left, when we're looking at this person's heart. This is the inferior of the antenna, which is taking deoxygenated blood, uh, has more of a blue look to it, from all of those veins that are below the heart, taking all that back into this chamber, and this is the, of course, the superior of the antenna, taking deoxygenated blood from the area above the heart, into this chamber, this is the right atrium. So let's go ahead and right atrium, there's a little doorway that separates this chamber from the right ventricle. This doorway is called each right of the valve, because when you look down on this valve, you'll flash that open and close. It looks like it's kind of like, I was saying simple. This is a cusp, this is a cusp, that's a solid splash, swing it over. That's right, that's right, cusp of valve. The right ventricle, larger chamber, if that's right, the valve opens, and this chamber contracts and squeezes, blood's gonna enter into here. You can see that associated with these valves are these little uh, strands, called cordial tendons, and one of those a bit. Let's go ahead into the right ventricle, and the right ventricle squeezes, it's gonna shoot up through the pulmonary valve. The word pulmonary always has to do with lungs, so this valve is going to be a lot blood that has to do with it, and then it should go onto the lungs. The pulmonary arteries are the blood vessels that are taking blood to the left, to the right lung. You see that? There's two parts that are in the room. This goes to the left, this goes to the right. Arteries are always leaving the heart, taking blood away from the heart. I've heard students have this test before, and I've heard students assume that arteries are red, veins are blue. In a systemic circuit, no tube from the body, that is true. But it's flipped in the lungs. When you take blood away from the heart to the lungs, it's actually blue because it's lacking oxygen. When you go to the lungs and pick up the oxygen and take the blood back to the heart, those veins have red blood. So just remember, arteries are always leaving the heart, veins going to the heart. And yes, the lungs is the next definition. Let's go to the next slide for the rest of the sequence on the left side of the heart. The sequence of blood flow from the lungs back to the heart is going to take oxygenated blood from the big arrow through the left pulmonary vein and the right pulmonary vein into this chamber over here, just below that atrium. Now, I know this little red guy here looks like it's coming into the right side of the heart. Now, if you look carefully, this uh, particular vein coming from the right lung goes just behind these other blood vessels and does connect right here to the interior of the left atrium. Blood passing through the left atrium to the left ventricle is going to go through what's going to valve that prevents backflow. And that valve is called the bicuspid valve because this particular valve has only two cusps, not three. A so nickname for this valve is the mitral valve. And I'll explain why. So the mitral valve is the same thing as the bicuspid valve. Uh, someone who named this is very creative in terms of their imagination. They thought that this valve reminded them of a mitre. And a mitre is one of those um, bishop or propats. You may be familiar with this. Okay, one of these kind of masters, a little scroll cap part. Here's the guy. Anyways, um, you know, those two parts of the hat, something about this valve reminded them of that. So you know about bicuspid or mitral, whatever works in textbooks usually will we'll refer to a full terms. So that particular valve uh, is controlling back close to that. When this uh, left ventricle squeezes and it contracts, you don't want blood going back, backwards, back in the atrium. You want it going out to the aorta. And there's a valve that prevents blood from going back in the left atrium once it's reached this blood vessel. So the left ventricle, when it squeezes, blood goes through this particular valve here, it's hard to see, but it also has to be cusp. The aortic valve is going to lead to the aorta, the largest, uh, strongest artery in terms of its thickness in the body. The aorta, the average person, is about the thickness of a garden hose. Picture a garden hose right there, uh, moving above your heart. That's crazy to think about. But you want to be tough, working strong, because the blood is rocking out of the heart uh, through that. You do not want to tear. And it's very unlikely that the aorta is going to tear, because this is strong. Uh, but uh, you know, really, your trauma is going to crash it, could tear it. And a tear in the aorta uh, could cause someone to, uh, to die very quickly, because uh, the amount of blood that would be coming out would be uh, quite a lot in terms of uh, how quickly it connects to that blood vessel. And yes, the body of the next definition, you can see that the aorta, uh, it has these little uh, arteries that, that come out from the top of the spirit, taking blood to the arms, taking blood up to the head, and then the rest of the blood goes down to the descending aorta, which goes behind the heart, and goes to the all the major arteries, uh, goes to the rest of the body. I have a simplified uh, blood flow diagram that I can because when we look at the heart and how quickly it's ready is, sometimes it's hard uh, to remember what this is for. Let me give you some hints and we use here that will help. So I'm going to move to the left side. Uh, keep in mind this is a boxy depiction. This is not anatomically accurate in terms of um, the space involved, in terms of the angles and such. But the sequence is still the same. Here's the superior vena cava. Here's the inferior vena cava. And that's me taking blue blood, the oxygenated blood, back into the heart. That's why I'm using blue here. So they both lead to here. Here is the right atrium. And of course, this little doorway is the tricuspid valve. That leads to the larger chamber, that's inferior to the right, and the right ventricle. And here's a case for remembering what side the tricuspid valve is on. TV, RV. 
You can watch TV in your RV. Huh? So that's where you can remember it. Now the track doesn't allow it to break back over here. Break vegetable, it should be ready to. If this is taking blood to the lungs, because it's blue, you want to get oxygen back. You can call this the pulmonary valve. Remember that the blood is going this way. So the pulmonary valve leads to the pulmonary artery. It's taking blood away from the heart. Here's the uh, right, sorry, it's been here's the left, rather. Pulmonary artery, and here's the right pulmonary artery. So that's what goes to the lungs. Just in the field, see what that's in it. I feel it. Pick up the oxygen, and the oxygen attaches to the hemoglobin, which right here, more down blood vessels. Uh, it becomes red. So, when we get back in the heart, we're now on the superior left side. This would be the left pulmonary vein. Here, over here, this is going behind the heart into this region of the atrium. This would be the right pulmonary vein. And both of those uh, blood vessels lead to, of course, LA, the left atrium. And remember, this is not trying to like over here. It has two cuts. So this is the bicuspid valve, also the mitral valve. And down here is the left ventricle. This is the largest chamber's heart. It's slightly larger uh, than the right ventricle. Depending on what anatomical uh, you see with, with cross sections through it, depending on how anterior or posterior they are, sometimes the right ventricle will appear larger, uh, depending on what angle or what part of the heart you're going through. But left ventricle, uh, slightly bigger than the right ventricle. And of course, the blood flow comes into here, comes through here, and then it's going to go up. Once the left ventricle contracts, this is the aortic valve, and that takes blood into the aorta. And you know what? The blood going through here, because you kind of think how the aorta comes up and has that little uh, loop that goes down. This looks like an A. If you look at how the uh, left pulmonary artery kind of goes in front of it, um, sometimes you remember that aortic aorta, uh, that major blood vessel taking oxygenated blood into the entire body, and remember there's also arteries that branch off from the top. So this is simplified uh, blood flow diagram. When we look at heartbeat and the valves and how the actual sound of the heart corresponds to the valves closing and opening, a lot of textures will refer to the and the sound is actually corresponding to the valves closing. Um, the first sound is actually these valves closing. So the lobe is these two. These are the atrial ventricular valves, or AV valves. So remember that is they're separating the atria and the ventricles. Atria, ventricles, so atrial ventricular valves, separate the ideas, there are these valves. Bicuspid ventricle or bicuspid and tricuspid. Uh, the other two, the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve, are semi-weird valves named after like a half moon uh, circuit. So semi-weird valves is these two. So these close together and these close together. You can see that when the AV valves are open, these are going to close. When these are open, these are going to close. This picture, by the way, we're referring to the aortic valve, uh, we feel like the uh, tricuspid and pulmonary valves are similar. So, uh, think about this way, the, the love starts with the valves that are kind of higher up, or higher up, not the, the best term, but the, the ones that happen kind of first, in terms of thinking about blood coming in. So, remember, blood coming in from the heart to the side, you just pass through these valves first, so think about them closing first, in terms of the sequence of love and dump. And because these two close for that first sound, they close when the ventricles squeak. Why do they close the ventricles squeak? Because you can imagine blood pulling into these parts, and boom, the walls just come back together. You want blood to go this way, this way, and this way, not. Back. You want to go backwards into the atrium. So when this contracts, these two, the bicuspid and the tricuspid, or AV valves, have to close. Conversely, when these are relaxed, and you want blood coming out of the atria, down to the ventricles, you want these to be open. And you also want these to be closed at high because you just squeeze blood out of the ventricles, and you want it to stay on its way to the lungs, out of the body, in these blood vessels. So you have to have that coordinated opening and closing. Look up, look up, look up. Sicily is diastole. Um, when we look at the term sicily, that's basically like saying contraction. So when the ventricles contract, they're in ventricular sicily. Diastole is the opposite. So when the ventricles relax, it's diastole. And when ventricular contraction is sicily happening, you're going to get the atria doing the opposite, and vice versa. So you use the term atrial sicily, uh, atrial diastole. And so contraction, this is the relaxation, and the chambers are going to relax when they're ready to receive blood. Think about the ventricles. Uh, when they just shot blood out of the heart, they then need to, you're ready to protect blood from the atrium, so they're going to relax and open up, get the blood going in there, and then we can sicily. The way that keeps you straight is um, blood pressure charts. Like the blood pressure 120 range, that's systolic over diastolic. The higher number corresponds to higher pressure uh, contraction. So systolic, the higher number 120 or whatever the solid number of blood pressure per person is going to be a higher number of It's contraction rather than that relaxation to the lower pressure. So the valve responds to the pressure changes. I told you I was talking about those little uh, tendons, those little kind of like white strands associated with the valve so they open and close. So as the trigger pressure rises, as they contract above the atrial pressure, that causes the valve to be pushed close. And then the ventricles relax and expand, that pulls on those little white tendons called chordae tendinae. Now remember, tendons connect muscle to bone. These are a little bit different than average tendons because it's connecting uh, valves, part of the end of the heart, to other parts of the thing. They're all connected to the myocardium, uh, the, uh, the heart muscle itself. So as the pressure changes because of the contraction of that's the open and close the valves because these are attached to those little flaps. Cardiac output can be more of that blood pressure, uh, parts of the uh, blood vessel lessons. But cardiac output is a measure of how much blood is physically leaving the heart. Slow volume is milliliters of blood that leave the heart with each ventricular contraction of the system. So how much blood is physically leaving? And of course, how often is it leaving? Heart rate, we're talking 60 beats per minute, suppressing heart rate quality. Are we talking 130 beats per minute, which is like somebody typically doesn't use blood. Um, it can be a lot higher than that. So cardiac output can be increased by having just a lot higher heart rate. Because having your heart beat faster, you have blood, and have heart rate increase, of course. But if you increase stroke volume, you don't have to have as much of heart rate increase. How do you increase stroke volume? Exercising. Blocking a lot of exercising. If something gets over the heart, it's super efficient in terms of how much blood you actually see out of these beats. 
you'll find that their resting heart rate tends to drop. Because their rest, the body doesn't need to have as many distractions because it's easy to charge. They're actually uh, using a lot more heart, uh, heart rate, heart rate, using a lot more blood, rather. Here's a picture of the cardiac cycle in terms of um, pressure in the aorta, pressure in the ventricles, how much blood is in the ventricles, and then this is showing you the ECG, like a cardiogram, and then a low cardiogram, in terms of the sound of the heart. So aortic pressure related to ventricular pressure. Let's look at this. So, when you get the ventricle fluid contracting the crystals, that's when you get this little lip of blue lines, and that corresponds to the ejection, letting go of blood out of the ventricles. And of course, that's going to increase the pressure in the aorta, because where does blood go in the ventricle contraction? It's going in the aorta, sending the blood to the body. At the same time, when the ventricle dope squeezes, that's why this red line drops. This is, this line is boom. The amount of blood in the ventricle flattens because that blood is leaving the ventricles. And you're going to see more about this uh, later on in the lesson. What is this little bump? The, 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 all those uh, heart markers, what does that mean? Break it down a sec. But I just want to show you how it's all related here uh, in terms of when the ventricles are squeezing and letting blood out of them. And at the same time, look, when the ventricles go back to the in terms of kind of relaxing, the pressure lessens. And then once they're open up again and waiting for blood, what's going to happen? The ventricular volume is going to increase because the atria just on the top are squeezing blood back to the ventricles and it's going to happen all over again. And this is happening in a matter of you know, two or three seconds. We need to let heart rate very fast. So when it comes to initiating RV, it's really fascinating that the heart, uh, automaticity, this term here means that this is the one place in the body where electrical signaling happens apart from neurons initiating it. So you get movement of this amazing organ without neurons specifically being inside of it. The basic assumption people have they think that the cardiac conduction system gets a bunch of neurons or nerves within the heart. That's not true. There are pathways within the tissue of the heart, uh, within these um, muscle fiber tracks that guide the electricity through it, and that's described as the cardiac conduction system. So that's why electrical signaling makes its way to the heart and coordinate the fashion of the organ. The final issue or F8 node is this little bluish purple dot right there. Uh, underline that in blue. That's located uh, in the kind of superior wall of the right atrium. It's kind of an interesting looking uh, drawing. And here's that exposed uh, right atrium. In this particular shot, we can't uh, see that atrium very effectively, but the atrium does not have much to do with starting up the heartbeat. This tiny atrium, though, is really important because this is a natural pacemaker of your heart. If you ever heard of somebody having a pacemaker, that's a part of the pacemaker, where we uh, attach a little bit of the heart that helps initiate the heartbeat in a proper way. So somebody is having some trouble with their FA node working naturally, you can then attach a pacemaker to it to keep it in check. So this is the natural pacemaker that we are born with. And some people have no trouble with the pacemaker their entire life. It's doing uh, the proper coordinated, well-paced uh, set of contractions and relaxations to happen. So there is, yes, a uh, nerve that comes to stimulate the FA node, and then once that's stimulated, it's also raised in terms of the electrical signal flowing through the heart in the right way. So the FA node then sends a signal into here, the AD node. So this is more of the uh, kind of inferior parts of the right atrium. We did it red. The atrial ventricular node. You notice our AD valve on the previous slide? AD node has an AD because you can see that if it comes superior, it's like inferior or rather part of the atrium, that's going to be adjacent to uh, the opening of the ventricle. So that's why it's called AD node. It's very close to the opening of the ventricle. And here, once again, a good image of the chordae tendon A under there. Uh, the AD bundle then takes the signal down uh, through the septum, the, uh, the border between the left ventricle and right ventricle, and extends what are called Purkinje fibers. So all these little fibers are going to intervene the muscle fibers of the ventricles, named after Dr. Purkinje. And those Purkinje fibers, when the electrical signal goes through, all those can get through the ventricles the left and right and track at the same time. It's supposed to. And if you're wondering about what up with the left uh, atrium, uh, because the signal is going through the SA node, uh, it's able to simultaneously stimulate. Uh, through the screen tracks, uh, the atria contracting at the same time. And so this sequence is able to get the atria and ventricles contracting in coordinated fashion to make sure that blood is flowing properly in the screen heart. An EKG or ECG is an electrocardiogram. So the English uh, abbreviation of ECG, EKG, is from uh, the German for uh, cardio. It gives you an EKG, the same thing. Uh, this is measuring electrical density in the heart. And we look at one single booklet, there are two different points, they call the waves. The P wave, see that red? It's right here. This has to do with the atria being depolarized. And depolarization atria is going to make it to atrial pressure. That's attraction. So here is atrial depolarization. So that is going to make the left and right atria contract. And you'll see a little hump, a little change in the electric electricity, I think, flowing to that part compared to this here, the CRS, and the ventricles. So you wonder why is this bump not high up? The ventricles are much larger in terms of them being this, this older blood and, and the muscular chamber is going to be in a stronger way to supply out of the heart. And so the time of the ventricles and how much is flowing to them is going to keep it bigger. So the CRS complex that has a hole from this point up here and down, this is ventricular depolarization. All of this. Remember the terms of uh, polarization and depolarization from uh, action potentials? It has to do with this. Um, remember that with uh, action potential, it goes up and down similar to this, where it's depolarization, depolarization in terms of uh, sodium potassium. You can kind of use those terms here to help remember that. It's depolarization and depolarization. Uh, so you can go use the neuron, potassium and neuron, uh, having depolarization, depolarization. This whole thing here, just you felt depolarization, after it, you have re-depolarization. That gets the ventricles back into their relaxed state. You get that ventricular diastole. Mm -hmm. So T here, the T wave, is actually the event that depolarizes the ventricles. That's getting ready for sleep more blood. So this is ventricular synthesis. Re-polarization. You're wondering, what happened to atrial repolarization? I'll see that here. It's covered by QRS, so the repolarization atrial actually happens during this time, but the electrical signals of the ventricles just outweigh it by far. So I uh, ECG, you're going to notice this, I'm overlapping that. So it's really going to show you how uh, this ECG reading can vary and how uh, a doctor can interpret it in terms of what's going on in the heart. So first one is, let's say that, yeah, there's that. 